exceptionally, uh, I will be the next speaker because I, I've conducted the research on, let's say, data portability over uh, one year, and I think it completely uh, makes sense uh, to uh, to present it here in the future of API regulation uh, track. Uh, so I will share my uh, screen like uh, other speakers, uh, and uh, and we will be able to address uh, th that topic together. Uh, so I'll go. I'll go uh, full screen, and uh, uh, yeah. Let's say that um, of course APIs. You know, when a lot of people have talked about me, talk, talk with me about data portability, and um, and they say, oh, it's not there yet. And I often say to them, yes, of course we have data portability at large scale. APIs and web APIs, especially between two different applications, are actually data portability, but they are not user-centric data portability. They're mostly application-centric or company-centric data portability, meaning that it's just the two companies or the two applications that who decide what they want to share together. The user is not really at the center. The user can decide some scopes, uh, you know, accept uh, uh, specific uh, uh, scopes that we, that are presented to to the user. But let's say he's not; he doesn't have a real user-centric uh, uh, place and, and approach when he, when we talk about data portability. So, uh, um, so we conducted a study of, of more than uh, two hundred companies about yeah, if you want your data back, uh, a company who have uh, APIs actually. But if you want your data back, what happens? So, uh, we wanted to do uh, uh, this study, and we are presenting you uh, these uh, the results. So my name is uh, Mehdi Mejawi. I'm the founder and chairman of the API Days Conferences. And you can, uh, and all the content here is extracted from a research report, GDPR Data Portability, the Forgotten Right. Just to say that GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, um, and and it's, a, uh, it's a regulation that is implemented not only uh, for Europe, but let's say for that every European citizen or every citizen of the world who is based in Europe can uh, uh, is can be under the, this regulation, and it has been followed by many other regulations like CCPA in California, and also uh, um, uh, Colorado just passed a new bill uh, for a new privacy regulations. But we have also other countries that are coming. So portability is a really important topic, and especially in the in the developer community where a lot of people want their data back, and so data portability is is the key. So a first definition of data portability. In the user-centric data portability, data portability is the ability for someone to get back his data from an application or a platform and to be able to send the data to another application or another platform uh, without a real loss. So that's really what we call user-centric data portability. And in this presentation, we will see that um, this study on more than 200 companies that, yeah, uh, let's say portability has been a forgotten right in privacy regulations. So let's first let's address the potential, the uh, the the incentive for data portability. So it has huge impact for citizens, businesses, and country if it is applied. Uh, let's remember a time where actually we could not transfer our phone number from a carrier to another carrier. That was really complex, and you know you were completely st stuck and locked in in a specific carrier if you wanted to keep your phone number. But when the phone number portability came out, it was obvious that now I could change carrier keeping my phone number. Let's remind that in most of the countries it has, it has been regulation led and as an obligation for phone carriers and telcos to support the, the phone number portability. It, it, it favored many things. It favored uh, user experience. It favors competition. It favored like a liquidity in a sense of, of the user base in the market, really um, making like the, the best win instead of having being the one uh, having the first uh, user base and logged in directly. So let's say for citizens, it's really four main uh, uh, outcomes. First is convenience and choice. If you have data portability, you can bring your data where you want. So actually, you can choose exactly the platform or the service provider you uh, you are uh, using directly without any lock-in. It's also service access and quality because if I come to a new service with my data capital, so the data I, I accumulated uh, from other services, I bring uh, uh, I bring some value to the service, and so the service can also make me specific. Uh, uh, integrations or specific uh, onboardings based on the data I bring to the game so I can have a better uh, service. Uh, 
For example, uh, just imagine I, I use a travel platform or, or, uh, and uh, all my trips and all my rankings are already in this user platform, in this um, uh, travel platform. If I go in another travel platform and I bring these ratings, uh, uh, you know that will be uh, that will be uh, really useful for me, in a sense, um, because I will be uh, I'm seen as a first-class uh, citizen user, and I will be able to import my ratings and have a better experience. It's also economic value and savings because uh, for companies who have to recollect the data that has been already collected by someone else, uh, you know, it costs a lot in marketing to get uh, data from users uh, with their consent. If the user actually has put the data somewhere else and just want to import it into my system easily in two clicks, you know, that's a lot of uh, savings for uh, for uh, for uh, for companies to uh, to work with me. It's also participation and engagement because. It's about user experience. All the data I put in another system, if I can put it easily in a new system, it's also about uh, how I can try new uh, services, sign up easily, and, and have a complete uh, full experience on a new service. For businesses, it's uh, it's innovation, uh, you know, because uh, uh, like yeah, with new data that has been collected by others with the user consent that I have, I can build new innovative service. I'm a, a, a real estate uh, application, but I have access to, uh, for example, banking data from my users. I can build innovative service to have to search exactly the the flat uh, they can rent or they can buy directly uh, for a better search engine. Just an example. Uh, it's also fair competition because. If data is locked in, enabled uh, to lock users, if we have a, a, a real data portability, right, user-centric one, we will be able to have, um, we will just, user will just decide based on the features of the application or the experience, but not the fact that the data is already there. Just an example, if I'm, all my photos are in a specific uh, social network and I want to go in another social network that in, I cannot really import my data there, it will be quite uh, complex. Uh, for me to really change, or if all my friends are in the same uh, network and I don't have my social graph uh, being exportable. The third one is revenue. Uh, you know, data portability uh, would enable uh, some business to uh, uh, maximize potential revenue faster by knowing more about their users with their consent. Uh, they will be able to uh, make better decisions, better recommendations, and so learn more and, and actually accelerate their uh, mar product market fit. And for the market globally, uh, it has also some good impacts, you know, about the economy, uh, you know, um, depending on regulations, but for the economy, especially with GDPR, but with uh, every national regulation, um, you know, the fact when you have uh, a, a common uh, transparent ecosystem and, trans and you lower the transaction cost be between changing from one platform to another, actually, you generate a lot of value in the ecosystem. Uh, you, you make one main actors lose value, but the whole... Uh, uh, forest, if I may, uh, of a new uh, app application and platform will benefit from this uh, liquidity on the market. It's also about equity uh, because like, it's about what we call a, a stakeholder capitalism in a sense that user will be able to give your data to fund your growth and to fund your user experience uh, with their data. So it's about engaging them and with their uh, assets. Uh, so engagement, we talk about it um, because if you participate with your data uh, uh, to some onboarding into some, the company you want to see happening and successful, uh, the data you accumulated into other platforms, that can be extremely useful. The last one is extract and avoidance. You know, it's again, it's this always discussion about lock-in. The fact that some people are able to keep you because they own your data and you don't, they don't want the data to be portable. Actually, they, are, they, uh, they, they can extract a lot more value than others. Uh, and so in a monopolistic approach, and uh, we know that in economy, monopolies are not the most efficient way to run a, a market and transactions. So yeah, so for all these reasons, it's also good for the market. So this is a state of regulation worldwide. If we consider GDPR here in Europe as the, the one of the first and the most uh, advanced regulation, let's say some countries like uh, USA, like Argentina, uh, um, Argentina, uh, U uh, United Kingdom, Japan, or New Zealand are actually having G really GDPR-like regulations. In the US, it's mostly in California, in, in Colorado, in Virginia. 
and not all the states are actually uh, having uh, having a, a data privacy regulation as advanced, but a lot of uh, states are actually uh, uh, evaluating the opportunity. We have all, some other countries who have at least some national laws or authorities uh, uh, that 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 promotes a specific vision of uh, of data governance and, and sovereignty. But yeah, so just to say. Um, it's coming, and according to Gartner, two thirds of the population will be under privacy regulation um, by 2023. So it's coming. So uh, why also the data portability is important? It's because uh, you know um, the, 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 uh, the data is really a way to capture value. Is really a way to capture value for companies. Uh, we'll just take the example of Facebook. So if we uh, divide the number of revenue per region per user. In the US, we have 152. Uh, in Europe, we have 58. In Asia, we have 12. Uh, in the rest of the world, we have 10. And so if we divide the, the if we uh, allocate this revenue um, and, and we estimate the market capitalization per area, uh, per user, so in the US, it's almost $1,300 of market capitalization of the data of a user. In Europe, it's almost 500. It's 102 in, in, in Asia and $85 in the rest of the world. But the, what does that mean, uh, for example, for a US user, is that the market value of uh, the data of a user on the, his lifetime uh, value of, uh, as a user is estimated today, according to Facebook uh, market capitalization, to $1,300. So that means every Facebook user in the US has an average of $1,300 of capital of data that he could be able to reinvest in other application. Of course, it's not direct dollars, but it has value, it has this market value uh, that we could reinvest into other platforms. Of course, not every company is able to extract as much value as Facebook with Facebook data. So your $1,300 on Facebook may be worth a few hundred on, on another platform that will be able just to get a part of it. But still, that's a huge economic power that user can have when they, if they exercise their right to data portability. Uh, yes, and it's again for Amazon data, Google data, and a lot of other platforms, Netflix, Uber, and a lot of uh, uh, big platforms. So if we really consider all this accumulation of, of capital, user will ha may have a real, uh, a real strong power into making data portability a reality uh, and funding new platforms with their digital capital. So we, how we did we conduct this study? So we, we went to social networks through email and we gather a pool of 50 volunteers, so five zero, 50 volunteers to accept, uh, to be followed and helped into collecting their data according to different regulation in the US, in Europe, in Asia, in, in the rest of the world. And, and yes, so the goal was really to, uh, to get this data and help them with a team of lawyers, full-time dedicated to that, to get their data back. The study is made on 230 companies uh, and actually 229, but, but still. But yeah, so just to say it's a really representative uh, subset of companies and mostly the main platforms of the world. So what are the results of the study about data portability? It does not work. Globally, it does not work. And then we will explain you why actually it mostly uh, we can consider and we can say it does not work and mainly for six reasons. So let me present you the six ways GDPR port data portability is broken. So according to the 50 users on 230 companies, that you can imagine the number of data portability requests we made, we've seen really a pattern of six reasons why companies are not uh, uh, playing fair. The first one is the data provided by the data controllers, like the companies, in response to our request, was not transferred in a machine-readable format. So it's an obligation to give to have real data portability is to be able to give your data not only just in raw, uh, in raw text, but in a way that can be reused by a machine or another program. They don't have to provide it by API. Most of them, it can be a file. Uh, but yeah, so they have to give it in the machine readable format. And actually, they did not. Uh, so this is an example of a French bank who said, yeah, you can find your data in the attached file. And actually, that was a PDF, right? And we've seen this so many times, like so many, so many times, up to 60% of the time, it was a non-machine readable format, just to tell you. And even banks, because we take the example of banks, because actually they have APIs to give your data back, you know, according to 
uh, PSD2 regulations, but when you ask your right to, of portability, they don't give you the, the data via the API. They just give you a PDF of your data just to tell you how it's broken. The second one is that the personal data was considered too difficult to provide. In most of the regulations, you have 30 days to comply. You have 30 days to comply and you have to uh, give the data uh, in a way uh, in a way that is secure and for the user to uh, to get his data uh, in, a, in a qualitative aspect. But some companies were claiming, actually a lot of companies were claiming it was too difficult to provide your data in the time. So we, we take a, so for companies where who don't have an IT culture, why not? But for companies like WhatsApp, it was funny to see that, yeah, WhatsApp say your data is encrypted, we can do it, but actually they were able to give your data on specific uh, um, uh, on specific um, uh, backups like Google Drive, so they are able to give your data in clear on Google Drive, but they don't. They are not able to save your data to give your data back directly to you as a user. So that's weird. So it seems at some point uh, there is some uh, some options that uh, they decide, but which are, but as a user, when you want to get it back on your system, uh, you can't. The third one is like personal data was transmitted as an empty file. You know, the, uh, all these regulations oblige the data provided by the user. That's the definition, data provided by the user. But then the definition uh, argument uh, can be really special. What is provided by the user? Are my location, which are passive, provided by me? Some people argue that yes, some people argue that, argue that no. It's the data I produced, but this is the, really the data I provided. So a lot of companies actually play on this definition. Of course, I think my locations, if I allow an application to track my location, I consider it's my data. But many companies play on that on that, uh, on that that definition to avoid to give you your data. And so they give you really poor uh, data. So uh, this is a dis the discussion about provided by. And so for that, we'll just take the example of Facebook. Uh, so Facebook does, when you ask an export of your friends list, Facebook just gives you the strings, like just a chain of character of your friends. But uh, the problem is that it's not recognizable on the network. So it's uh, it's uh, the data provided by the user, but it doesn't give your list of contact. If we consider that the friend relationship is a bi-directional relationship, when you accept someone as a friend, you confirm to Facebook that this person is a friend. So at least they will be able to give you back your the data, at least their ID, the, the ID of the user of the network, because it was an active and positive action of my part to give you, uh, to, to tell you this person is a friend. So because I did not type it directly, but I just accepted yes from a connection, they consider it's not uh, provided by the user. Of course, my followers on Twitter are not, are not my data, of course, uh, but friends, because of this big directional accept and uh, aspect and the fact that it's uh, uh, it's um, a positive and active consent uh, should be provided uh, at this. So uh, a recent study from uh, New York University showed that most of the developers see no value in the Facebook uh, uh, export uh, data uh, from GDPR uh, and data portability, where millions of developers see value on the Facebook API. So there is a big problem here. So another uh, another reason why it was a fail a failure personal data was delayed from being provided as a, as we said we have thirty days uh, actually we have thirty days to uh, to comply with um, the regulation to give your data back according to many of the regulations but just an example uh, up to sixty percent of surveyed businesses like fifty eight exactly failed to address requests uh, in, in 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 the right time and at large scale it's a study from uh, from talent but just to tell you how um uh, how uh, uh hard it is for user you to with apis you have your data almost instantly uh with this privacy regulation you have to wait 30 days sometimes more we had an example of a, a, a european retailer who who took five months to get our data but they have apis to give it to partners why they don't give it back to you directly and so one important aspect, the data subjects experience so as a user was really, really fragmented. Uh, so um, the, the, the experience of user is really poor. And sometimes the discussion you have to do are completely surrealistic. Uh, let's take this example with uh, Airbnb. Uh, so we asked our data to be transferred to our Dropbox account. 
right? So we ask, yeah, we want to exercise our right on, on, on portability and please transfer it to our Dropbox. Uh, it's a public Dropbox, you know, so it's a, it's a, it's not a, a, you don't have to sign in or to have a Dropbox account. And you can see option one, we send you the file. Option two, can you provide the contact details of the person from Dropbox and we will send to, it to this person, full name, official email address, attach a photocopy of proof of identity. Really? You're asking me to send you a photo ID of a person that I would infringe actually the privacy regulation by sending you the information if I had it. And of course, I don't have the information of all the engineers at Dropbox. That doesn't make any sense, right? Completely, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, and so this, you know how Airbnb has great APIs, but just to say uh, here, alternatively, as we have already sent you the file containing the data, you can forward the email the attachment to your point of contact in Dropbox. Thank you very much, support. Yeah, well, that's great. Uh, you just asked, uh, you just learned me, I can forward emails. Thank you, thank you very much. Another example, uh, again from Airbnb, who say that, yeah, um, they say, oh, we cannot uh, encrypt the file ourselves. Uh, do you allow us, do you give us your consent to send uh, the JSON file to our external legal advisor who are able to encrypt the file and provide this to the Dropbox as requested. Really, Airbnb, you don't have any engineers uh, who, in, who is able to encrypt a JSON file? No, like just to tell you, they just try to make your uh, journey in data portability uh, a horrible journey. <coughs> and so again, uh, you can see this question, uh, uh, <laughs> you can see that uh, you know the discussion can happen. So it's really an experience that is, uh, that is really, really hard. Uh, so yeah, and that's just one of the examples. So on the 48 number of people who proactively volunteered, just seven actually got what they consider enough of their data, uh, 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 you know, according to the study. So we had four lawyers full time dedicated to help these 48 people. Only seven who actively part participate considered they had a significant uh, returning data uh, from data protection officers. That's really not uh, a great uh, number. Last one uh, is that uh, the data portability uh, requests were seen as troublemaking. The study found that in several cases, uh, <laughs> the, uh, and actually it's five percent of the cases, but it's not, it's not, uh, uh, it's still significant. They were threatening. They were really threatening to close the account. They say, "Oh, you want your data back? So okay, we we'll close your account." And so we have some users like it's like a, a blackmailing at some point. But we had some users who actually say, no, 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 I want to stop the study. Uh, I, you are, uh, because of you, uh, some running applications or some social networks wants to erase my data and I don't want, to lose my, don't want to lose my account, please stop the study. So just to tell you how hard it has been to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to try to have data portability from, from these companies. One uh, point that can be uh, uh, that can be noticed: at least ten percent of the data controller, the company we interviewed, um, were proposing a takeout service. So of course, uh, all the data was not there. The, the definition of provided by the user was not was kind of uh, controversial. But at least they had a, an automated takeout tool, so you can at least get what they accept to give you uh, back uh, in an automated way. One last thing before uh, having this very side chat with Kinlane talking about you know all these API led regulations. So we've seen many 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 uh, fines for not respecting privacy regulations, but for portability, we have seen zero euro zero dollars, <laughs> or since the regulation has been has been up, we've seen actually zero euro of fines on eight hundred fines. No fine was actually made on portability. So this is why we've we've uh, we've stated that. Uh, it's really the, for, the forgotten right of GDPR. Even the authority and regulations don't want to, uh, to sue companies for not respecting it. So, so uh, there are many solutions to implement GDPR data portability. Uh, APIs are one of them, but I will, have, uh, I will invite on stage uh, Kin Lane to talk with me about like uh, these regulations uh, there. So um, uh, if we can have uh, Kin for this fire such a discussion. And, or, and of course, if you have any questions, we will be glad to, to answer them uh, directly in the chat. Uh, 